hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 15th of July. You're tuned into our mid morning newscast here on Ali Dang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. North Korea fires scores of artillery shells into the East Sea on Monday in a drill near the border with South Korea. The firings came a matter of hours after the Koreas agreed to discuss North Korea's participation in the upcoming Asian Games in Incheon. Korea's ruling Senuri Party picks Kim Mu Song as its new party leader. The five-term lawmaker vows to build a strong party and a strong Korea. Plus, Egypt proposes a ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants in Gaza. Israel's security cabinet will meet later on this Tuesday to discuss the proposal. But our top story this morning, another day, another defiant show of military might from North Korea. In its latest provocation, North Korea fired about 100 artillery shells into the East Sea on Monday from a site near the military demarcation line. The move came just a matter of hours after the two Koreas set a date for a round of working-level talks ahead of the Asian Games in South Korea. Hwang Sang-hee reports. North Korea fired off around 100 artillery shells on Monday, just hundreds of meters away from the demilitarized zone. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said none of the projectiles landed in South Korean territory, but added it is rare for Pyongyang to fire so close to the border area. On Sunday, two short-range missiles were fired close to the demarcation line in Kaesong, which experts call a move clearly targeted at South Korea. On the one hand, it is protesting the joint military exercises between South Korea and the U.S. And on the other hand, it is calling for a shift in the Park Geun-hye administration's North Korea policy. The launches came just hours after Pyongyang agreed to meet with Seoul this week to discuss the details of its participation in the upcoming Asian Games in South Korea. Last week, the North said it would send a cheering squad along with athletes to the sporting event, which will begin in Incheon on September 19. North Korea sent a message via the inter-Korean hotline Monday morning, agreeing to South Korea's proposal to hold working-level talks on Thursday, July 17th at the South Korean side of the border village of Panmunjom. On top of the agenda will be the team's transportation, their accommodations and how the cost of the trip will be covered. The meeting follows Pyongyang's proposal to improve inter-Korean ties, and some say it could go beyond the scope of the sporting event. But considering its recent military provocations, North Korea is largely seen as trying to demonstrate its readiness for both dialogue or confrontation. The joint military drills between Seoul and Washington that begin this Wednesday could be another hurdle to better inter-Korean ties. Hwang sang Arirang News. And the United States has urged North Korea to halt its provocative acts after its second straight day of missile and artillery test firing. An official at the Pentagon said North Korea needs to fulfill its international obligations and commitments and refrain from actions that threaten peace and stability in the region. The U.S. State Department added that it's, it's steadfast in its commitment to the defense of its allies and will work closely and coordinate closely with South Korea on security issues. Now, in domestic politics, Korea's ruling Senuri Party has a new look on this Tuesday. At a party convention Monday, the party selected a new leader and four Supreme Council members. President Park Geun-hye, who was in attendance as well, used the opportunity to call for urgent action on the nation's reform policies. Ji Myung Gil reports. The ruling Senuri Party has a new party leader, Kim Mu Song, a five-term lawmaker who is considered to be more independent of President Park Geun-hye's influence. Kim promised a bigger role for the party in governance over the next two years and said he would seek to reset the relationship with the presidential house of Cheong Ade. Our Senuri Party has a clear goal. I will do my best for the success of Park Geun-hye administration. We must win the next general election and the presidential race. I will make a strong Senri party and a strong Korea. 
The newly elected Kim is expected to move ahead with reforming the party by assessing its problems, improving relations with the opposition bloc, and listening to the opinions of the people about how the presidential office is running the country. Kim beat out Seo Chung won to become chairman. Seo is a seven-term lawmaker and a confidant of President Park, who had promised to throw the party's full support behind the president. At the start of the party's convention, President Park delivered a keynote address in which she urged everyone to unite under the new party's leadership. The first order of business for Kim as the Senuri's new party leader will be gaining back a majority of parliamentary seats in the upcoming July 30th by elections. Pandes also say Kim may use his chairmanship as a springboard to run in the 2017 presidential election. In addition to Kim's win, four Supreme Council members were also elected. The ruling party is one of the key players in national governance together with the presidential office. The party hopes that with the new leadership in place, it will help revitalize the government and advance political reforms. Jim young Arirang News. Now, from preparations for inter-Korean reunification and efforts to breathe new life into the domestic economy, President Park who is expected to appoint her new cabinet this week, seems determined to carry on, of course, with the running of state affairs, which have been stalled since the awful ferry disaster back in April. Our Choi Yusun reports. During a meeting with her senior secretaries Monday, President Bak announced she would be launching on Tuesday her long-delayed committee to prepare for inter-Korean reunification. <laughs> 준비위원회 출범을 계기로 통일에 대한 국민들의 관심을 제고하고 통일 시대를 열어가기 위한 방안들을 논의해 나갈 것입니다. The Joint Government Civilian Committee headed by the President herself was scheduled to be launched in April in line with President Park's so-called reunification bonanza drive that was introduced earlier this year. The announcement, however, was delayed following the deadly ferry accident the same month. On the subject of another of her key state goals, economic revitalization, the president had directions for a new cabinet set to launch this week. President Buck specifically asked the new economic team to swiftly announce the government's policy direction for the second half of the year and push forward with her three-year innovation plan, including her deregulation efforts. Lastly, the president asked for a check on progress made in a drive for a creative economy. President Bak also urged the National Assembly to cooperate in passing a series of pending bills and the revitalizing the economy. On top of her state goals, the president now has the additional task of reforming the government and the public sector in the aftermath of the ferry tragedy. At Monday's ruling party convention, she pledged to do just that to ensure the nation's happiness and safety. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Now, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is defending his controversial push to expand his country's military role, saying it is actually limited in scope. In his first parliamentary session since his administration's decision to reinterpret Japan's pacifist constitution, Abe played down the expanded rules of engagement of collective self-defence, saying the newly adapted ability to aid a friendly nation under attack is strictly limited to things like mine sweeping in the Middle East. He said Tokyo would require a formal constitutional amendment to engage in collective self-defense similar to that of other countries. The Japanese leader also called for talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping during a regional meeting in Beijing in November. Abe made a point of mentioning their, their massive trading and business ties, saying that they had complex links despite very deep rows over territorial and historical grievances. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion 
Now to some very welcome news on the nation's trade front. Because Korean companies landed almost 34 billion US dollars in overseas plant construction orders in the first half of this year. That's a staggering 20% jump on year. Now Hyung Gang explains what's behind this growth. Most of the orders have come from the Middle East, Africa and the Americas. Korea's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy says more than 50 percent of all orders were from Middle Eastern countries, including Kuwait and Iraq. African nations, including Algeria, also bumped up their orders compared to the first half of last year, but Asian and European countries reduced their orders, having fewer projects and plans to build industrial facilities. The total number of orders is worth 33.7 billion U.S. dollars, nearly half of government's target of 70 billion for 2014. Experts say Korean firms opting to form consortiums instead of competing against each other was key to their winning bids in overseas markets. With the global economy expected to improve and emerging countries continuing to expand their industrial infrastructure, officials say the outlook for Korean construction companies in the latter half of the year does not look too grim. But with the lingering political uncertainties in the Middle East, insiders warn that it may not be too long before the orders stop coming in. They also point to a decrease in orders for offshore oil plants as Korea's three biggest shipbuilders struggle to ward off competition from China. The shale gas boom in North America is another factor, and observers say if the slum continues, Korean shipbuilders should quickly shift their focus to merchant vessels like tankers and LPG carriers as more orders are expected to come out from Europe. Na hyun Arirang News. Now, in financial news, Korea's banking industry has been going through massive restructuring of late, mainly due to slumping profitability. This of course because of uh, slow growth throughout the country and a low interest rate trend. But something that doesn't explain why some leading global banks around the world are weathering these kind of changes rather well and so many Korean banks are struggling to keep their heads above water, Hwang Jie reports. Here in Yaido, known as the Korean Wall Street, very few people are getting new jobs with many banks downsizing as they watch their profits slump. Citibank Korea, for example, received the voluntary resignations of 650 employees late last month, or 15 percent of the total staff number. Local banks' combined profits dropped to roughly 3.8 billion U.S. dollars last year, representing only a third of the profits the banks posted two years ago. Many point to slow growth and the low interest rate trend for the shrinking profits, which have hurt the banking sector's traditional cash cow, the interest margin. But over the same period, the world's top 1,000 banks saw their profits hit an all-time high of $920 billion, up more than 20% percent from 2012. So what's causing the gap between global leaders and local banks? Experts say that banks in Korea are too dependent on the easy way of making money, the interest margin, and aren't focusing enough of their energy on new business opportunities. While on average half of the profits at foreign banks comes from the interest margin, nearly 90 percent of the local banks' profits come from the difference in interest rates. Tight government regulations are another reason. The financial industry is heavily affected by government regulations, but they were tightened after the Asian financial crisis, which prompted the industry to lose vitality and failed to actively penetrate overseas markets. While the nation's financial regulator did lay out plans last week to remove regulatory hurdles in the financial sector, experts add that more efforts are needed to breathe life into the industry. Huang Jie, Arirang News. China has reportedly been blocking po popular mobile messaging smartphone applications like Line and KakaoTalk since earlier this month. The South Korean diplomat, speaking on the condition of not being named, said China informed Korea of the move on Monday, but also said the services would be restored soon. Industry sources say the shutdown was a possible attempt by Chinese authorities to block the sharing of information into the run-up of some rather sensitive anniversaries in China. Now, Beijing maintains a firm grip on the internet. Social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter 
remain closed off to the general public. Samsung Electronics has suspended business with a Chinese supplier suspected of employing children under the age of 16. The non-profit labor group China Labor Watch has accused Dongguan Xinyang Electronics of using at least five child workers to make parts and cases for Samsung smartphones. The Korean tech giant said previous audits of the Chinese company showed no signs of child labor, but it has responded to the claims by launching its own internal investigation. Samsung said it would permanently cut off ties with the Chinese supplier if their probe determines any underage workers were employed there. Xinyang has not yet commented on the accusations. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Tuesday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the news centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. So, Eunice, uh, Egypt is calling on Israel and Hamas to agree to a ceasefire. Uh, this is the death toll continues to mount in Gaza. Right, and that toll now exceeding 185 Palestinians dead in the week-long conflict. This ceasefire proposal submitted by Egypt is the most thought-out plan yet suggested by outside mediators. Our Kim Hyun Bin has the details. Egypt has proposed a ceasefire between Israel and Gaza that will take effect Tuesday morning, local time. In its proposal, Cairo's foreign ministry is calling on Israel and Palestinians in Gaza to de-escalate their conflict by 9 a.m. local time, after which a full ceasefire will go into effect within 12 hours. This will then be followed by negotiations in Cairo within 48 hours. According to reports, the proposal says Israel should end all hostilities in Gaza from the land, air and sea and refrain from launching a ground offensive that targets civilians. Hamas would have to stop firing rockets into Israel. Israel's security cabinet, headed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is set to meet early Tuesday to discuss the proposal. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry may also travel to Cairo Tuesday for talks with Egypt's president. However, the chance of a ceasefire ending a week of cross-border fire looks increasingly unlikely. One of the stumbling blocks is that Hamas wants hundreds of its members who have been detained by Israel to be freed. Israel, on the other hand, says his ongoing attacks are aimed at depleting Hamas and quashing his will to fight. Palestinian militants have resumed rocket attacks on Israel, and despite international pressure for a ceasefire, Israel continues to pound Gaza from the air and sea. Rocket fire from Gaza have been regularly intercepted, and only half a dozen Israelis have been injured. A health official in Gaza says around 180 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have been killed and nearly 1,400 injured since Israel started airstrikes last week. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. At least six people have been killed and 25 wounded, this time in Benghazi, as Libyan security forces and rival militias clashed with each other. Government offices and banks were forced to close as missiles were launched by forces loyal to former General Khalifa Haftar on Islamist militia bases. The country has fallen into disarray since the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. Flights in and out of Tripoli remain grounded after militias engaged in the worst fighting there in six months on Sunday. The United Nations said it was temporarily pulling all of its staff out of Libya due to the deteriorating security situation. Young activist Malala Yousafzai has met with Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan in her campaign to help release the 219 Nigerian schoolgirls still missing since their April abduction at the hands of Islamist militants. The Pakistani teenager who turned 17 on Saturday said it was her birthday wish to see them return home and said Jonathan promised to do all he could to accomplish that end. Malala also met with the parents of some of the missing girls in Abuja on Sunday and told them she regarded their daughters as her sisters and would stand up on their behalf. Malala shot to fame after surviving a gunshot wound to her head by Taliban forces who tried to silence the campaigner for girls' education. 
And finally, the luxury liner that struck a reef in shallow waters and capsized will be towed away for scrapping 30 months after it ran aground. The Costa Concordia was successfully refloated Monday following a delicate operation to move the submerged ship off a resting platform without cracking open its hull. Technicians have anchored the 100,000-ton ship as towing is set to begin on July 21st. It will journey 320 kilometers to Genoa, a trip expected to take about five days. Concordia's captain is under trial for manslaughter for abandoning the ship after causing that shipwreck. 32 people on board died in the crash. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the Incheon Asian Games, which will begin in September. Now, the big news here in the nation is, of course, the participation of the North Korean athletes. And it seems like they'll send more athletes than first expected. While North Korea initially stated that they would send 70 male and 80 female athletes for a total of 150 athletes to Incheon, they have now unofficially stated that they want to send more athletes, according to Kim Young-soo, the head of the organizing committee. With the working level talks scheduled on Thursday between the two Koreas at the Truth Village, Truth Village of Panmunjom, the number of North Korean delegation could be determined at that time. And staying with the Incheon Asian Games, on Monday, the organizing committee for the Games introduced two Winter Olympians as the newest Goodwill Ambassadors. And they are Olympic speed skating champion Lee Sang Hwa and short track gold medalist Park Seung Hee. And while it seems weird to have Winter Olympians named as Goodwill Ambassadors, the head of the organizing committee wanted the Winter Olympians to also promote summer sports. Meanwhile, they joined a list of athletes, including Chu Shin Su of the Texas Rangers and PGA golfer Che Kyung Ju, aka KJ Choi. And now, the last time Korean football fans had a chance to see Sun Min play was during the heartbreaking 1 0 loss to Belgium during the group stages of the World Cup. Now, they can see him again, this time in a different uniform, but here in Korea. With Sun Min's German club team Bayer Leverkusen set to play against FC Seoul at the end of the month during their Korea Tour 2014, set to play at least 45 minutes of the friendly. The German side will arrive on the 29th of this month and will hold their friendly at the Seoul World Cup Stadium on the next day. And now finishing things off, the 2014 Brazil World Cup has come to an end after Germany beat Argentina for their fourth title. But aside from that, what were some of the more memorable moments or stories during the tournament? Now taking a look here, first off, everyone would agree that defending champion Spain crashing out of the group stages was one of the craziest surprises and upsets, which makes it one of the more unforgettable moments. But then there was Brazil, who lost to Germany 7-1 in their semifinals match, which could not have been predicted by even the greatest experts in football. And then, of course, who can forget Luis Suarez, who decided to fight Italy's Giorgio Calani on the shoulder, leading to a four-month ban. 2014 Brazil World Cup definitely had its moments. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, it's going to be as muggy as yesterday for the upper areas. While well, southern regions will get a brief relief from the heat today, as the temperatures could be five degrees lower than yesterday. Well, that's due to clouds and monsoon rain, which are in store for Jeju and southern coast regions. So, up to 120. 12, 20 millimeters of heavy monsoon showers are expected for the mountainous regions in Jeju and 80 millimeters for remainder of Jeju, while 20 to 60 millimeters for the southern coast, while the light showers are expected for the rest of southern coast. And it will be a rain-free day for upper areas, though it's quite 
hazy right now here in Seoul. And here are the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 30, while Daegu and Gwangju will have a daily high of 29 and 28, and Busan should make it to 26 this afternoon. And for the other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of 26 and 29, while Tukdo will reach 28. Now, if you're having early vacation in Jeju, be aware of heavy monsoon rain. It's going to last till tomorrow. Well, that's all for now, and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Gion, and that's all we have for now. But we will be back for another newscast at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.